Kathy Cinco de Mayo. Welcome to First Mover, your first global look at today's action in the Bitcoin, blockchain, and digital asset space. I'm your host, Christine Lee, and joining me are my co hosts, Quintus, managing editor of Global Capital Markets, Lawrence Luton, and managing director of international content, Emily Parker. I'm still getting used to those titles out there, but. I, I should really just cut it short and just say, like, <laughs> Some guy, yeah. Lord, Lord Lewiton, Lord Lewiton. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'll take that. Sure. So checking in on Bitcoin, the CoinDesk Bitcoin price XBX index is currently trading at fifty-five thousand seven hundred and change. Bitcoin is slightly down about half a percent over the past twenty-four hours. The CoinDesk. Ether price ETX index is trading at 33.81. ETH is also dipping a bit, almost 3% over the past 24 hours. But really, the story here is Doge. Doge is just unbeatable. 67 cents right now on the Coindesk 20 data we have here. Doge is up over 25% over the past 24 hours. It touched its 69 cent. Uh, Goal that it tried to achieve on Doge Day. Maybe Emily, you you can start off us off with what's going on with Doge. <laughs> This is the Doe show. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, important to talk about because it's it's such a controversial cryptocurrency in the industry. You know, so many people still think of it as a joke or as lacking fundamentals, but this is some very real money that we are talking about. So as you said, it did break 69 cents, which was kind of like the goal for the Doge community on, on Doge Day. But um, now, you know, there's a bunch of forces that are, are, are combined here. We have eToro uh, announcing its support for it. Then we have Gemini right after that, the major cryptocurrency platform also adding Doge. And then we have an upcoming appearance by Elon Musk on Saturday Night Live, who has hinted that he is going to mention Dogecoin. And, you know, Doge is such a community-driven cryptocurrency that these kinds of things can have a massive impact on price. Yeah. Lawrence, I, I think you have something to say about that and, and the markets. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, look, I, I my first question is, is $4.20 the next target? But uh, the the other thing is that we kind, <laughs> yeah, we, we, we kind of look at it as, you know, many of the things that people say about Doge reminds everyone of what they were saying about Bitcoin. And it's the whole idea of the network effect. And here we are. Uh, Doge is being used. People are spending money. They're spending Doge on things like tickets. And we have to ask ourselves, you know, if we think about what what makes a currency, it's uh, that's part of it, right? It's a unit of accounting, uh, medium of transaction, and and store of value. Well, people are using it apparently somewhat as a medium of of transaction. Of so yeah, yeah. So there and, we go. And we have the markets, which are you know Bitcoin, and yeah, are slightly down. Yeah, uh, you know, but uh, Bitcoin had a rebound a little bit from a really bad price for for a lot of Bitcoin holders. It was down at to fifty three thousand dollars or so, and that was because Secretary Yellen uh, said yesterday, uh, early in the day, she said that interest rates would have to rise somewhat, in her words, uh, to keep the economy from overheating, uh, and that sent prices down. Higher interest rates means lower inflation. Lower inflation means. Uh, lower uh, price rise, and people forget that Secretary Yellen is no longer the Fed chair. So when they hear <laughs> her say that uh, prices, th that rates need to go up, they're like, "Whoa!" Uh, and she backtracked on that later on, saying, "Ah, oh, she didn't really mean it. I, that's not quite what I meant." And uh, the prices of Bitcoin went back up. Deja vu. All right. Well, our next guest is a leading blockchain investor, entrepreneur, and advocate. Most recently, he is developing a partnership between Vesper Finance and Chainlink to accurately determine total value locked on Vesper's decentralized finance platform. Joining us now from Chicago is Matthew Rosick, co-founder and chair of Block, a crypto infrastructure firm. Welcome to the show, Matt. So you're one of the early crypto investors in the space. I'd like to get your take on where we are in the cycle and what is your long-term perspective on where this industry is headed? Well, first of all, happy uh, happy morning and happy Cinco de Mayo. Uh, great to be on. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I mean, we're in a uh, a bull market uh, with with no uh, uh, no doubt about it. Um, the the Doge dynamic that that I'll just pick up on. Uh, th this is a fundamental piece of what makes crypto and blockchains uh, uh, so unique and so powerful. It's like they're they're cooperatives of of, uh, of humans getting together. And participating in a particular token or blockchain, and so 
I, I think uh, once people think of these these uh, these crypto networks as cooperatives, uh, I think other things kind of get exercised and other, other things get um, uh, thought of uh, through through Doge or Bitcoin or or, or, or otherwise. I think Doge hitting uh, the market cap it is now is uh, uh, pretty insane. Uh, but it exercises all these things we see on the periphery between Wall Street bets and this cooperative capital and all these things that are developing uh, on the periphery. And it's something to take note of. Uh, broadly defined, um, seeing uh, Bitcoin punch through 50,000, 60,000, seeing Ethereum punch through 3,000 is just incredible. And seeing the innovation, uh, the, the number of pitch decks I see, uh, the number of m and I see, the number of investment I see, this industry is super healthy and is going to continue to go on a, a massive bull run here. Yeah. Speaking of which, you're working with Chainlink to accurately determine total lock value on Vesper Finance, a DeFi platform that create, was created by your company, Block, that helps users earn yield. Total lock value is similar to the concept of assets under management in traditional finance. So explain what exactly you are doing. Maybe you can break that down for our viewers and why your method is more trustworthy than others out there. Well, I think you know we've we've seen a lot of um, innovation in DeFi. We've, we've seen a lot of uh, from last uh, summer's food festival uh, to the Cambrian explosion of of DeFi in the fall. Uh, there's a lot of attention and innovation happening here. Uh, we build Vesper to kind of bring it all together to simplify the user uh, experience and to do that with uh, a known team uh, doing things. Um, uh, that, that each smart contract is uh, audited twice by external firms um, and, and just professionalizing and advancing DeFi in as uh, best way possible that we can. We started that with three simple uh, pools, uh, 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 Wrap Bitcoin, uh, Ethereum, and USDC. And all these pools do is you deposit one asset and you earn more of that asset. So it's like a treadmill for your capital where uh, deposit ETH, earn ETH. And we extended that further with uh, Chainlink. So the Chainlink pool is deposit Chainlink and earn more Chainlink. So if you think about for hodlers, uh, this is a really awesome uh, treadmill for uh, holding onto your crypto and earning more. Uh, and we're also thinking about even doing that for uh, Dogecoin. So if you think about like Dogecoin hodlers, what can they do with that? Well, maybe they could earn more interest uh, on a DeFi platform like Vespa. The, the long-term vision of that is any other um, Ecosystem. So, so we chose Chainlink because it's got a, a really deep, uh, uh, awesome ecosystem of hodlers, of, of Chainlink Marines, uh, and just it's it's an awesome ecosystem. So we purposely chose that uh, as as one of these healthy communities to start uh, our um, single uh, token pool like that. And so you'll see more of those coming out. So if you look at the top twenty uh, market cap ERC twenties, we're going to continue to expand these pools uh, with, with, with others. So you can think of Uniswap and, and others as potential candidates for that. So we're going to have a big uh, portfolio of these uh, deposit X and earn X uh, pools. Good morning. So I just want to follow up on the points that you made about Doge. So the counter argument to Doge, as you know, it's relatively controversial in the industry, is that you know it lacks fundamentals. Um, there's no real cap on supply, or not enough of a cap on supply. A lot of people are just jumping into the Doge frenzy because you know Elon Musk tweeted about it, or, or you know not for any more underlying reason. And so the danger here is that you know if this Doge bubble bursts, there's a lot of newer investors that could. You know, potentially get very hurt, which could attract regulatory, unwanted regulatory attention to the cryptocurrency industry. I'm just curious how you respond to those Doge critics who who would say that this actually is not really good for the development of the industry. Yeah, it, it is definitely on the farthest edge of of risk uh, possible. I think in in crypto in many ways because of the lack of fundamentals, because of uh, the the underlying dynamics there but again the, the communities that kind of keep this alive and it was you know uh, originally a joke a meme uh uh and and here we're we're, we're seeing it uh strangely uh finding it's it's kind of a groove and the elon musk stuff like stuff that you could never think about five or ten years ago where you're thinking about the ascent of crypto and how this industry is growing i, I look at it as uh, simply an example, a primitive to show what happens when you uh, assemble a group of like-minded people to, to, to do something. Uh, and, and I think Doge is a, a, a snapshot of 
uh, what, what can be done in these crypto networks where you galvanize a community and people to, to go down a particular mission or a particular uh, uh, track. Do you think that that some of the criticism there uh, coming particularly from from the Bitcoin maxis, uh, isn't it sort of ironic making some of the same criticisms that traditional finance made of Bitcoin a few years ago? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not endorsing uh, Doge to be like the, the next <laughs> Ethereum or anything like that. Uh, I, I just look at, again, the, the primitive of what it's doing, the underlying of, of how it came to be. Uh, I, I think, you know, helpful that Elon Musk talks about it, uh, again, as a joke for the most part. But then this community is kind of there's this interesting uh, energy flow back and forth between what he does and, and the token. And so uh, I, I think, you know, there, there's this this influencer economy that's developing too, uh, you know, well outside of crypto that uh, has some interplay with how s some uh, cryptocurrencies do. So. Um, you know, the, 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 uh, you know, is Wall Street or others going to take Dogecoin seriously? They're barely getting their arms around and their heads around Bitcoin and Ethereum, let alone Doge. So I, I think that's kind of, it, uh, from them, uh, a total abstract. Um, and they're still trying to figure out how to onboard Bitcoin. Given that you've been involved with in this industry for such a long time, and this is such a bullish moment and it's an exciting moment, I'd, I'd love to hear just some of your more sober takes. Like, where are some areas that you, you are concerned about, that some red flags, places where you feel that cryptocurrency has not lived up to its original ideals? I mean, if I, if I look back over the shoulder the last 10 years, I am uh, <clears throat> probably uh, undershot what was going to happen uh, in 2021. And, and if I look at the opportunities in front of us, you know, obviously the, uh, the the Bitcoin trade is the most well-known trade in the world, and there, you still see human nature kick in to say, is it okay to invest? Uh, you know, how should I invest? Uh, invest, and yet you still have apprehension with individuals and institutions on adopting Bitcoin. Uh, they'll probably go through the same um, seven phases in terms of adopting Ethereum, uh, and so we're we're, we're seeing this kind of uh, play out where where. Uh, Crypto has been built on this retail, uh, this innovator, bottoms-up approach. And so the top-down of Wall Street, sovereign wealth funds, uh, institutional investors is now starting to show up You know, this year for the most part. We had some amazing outliers last year with MicroStrategy and others, but uh, boards are getting together in terms of compliance, custody, uh, all those dynamics on how to uh, put Bitcoin on their balance sheets. And that's a massive step, but that's not really innovation. That's not really adoption. That's not really leaning into the technology, uh, but that's a great start. If I, I take a giant step back in terms of the big opportunities for, for crypto, I, I look at two, um, and, and there, there's you know 50, but I look at two really big um, opportunities. One is in DeFi and the other one is in Web3. So DeFi obviously is, is you know, software seeding the world market. Dreesen, this one is software seeding banking. Like every layer of banking uh, is a layer of, of software now. And we're seeing that in, uh, with DeFi primitives, with lending, with uh, derivatives, with, with yield management. All these things are now uh, uh, part of the DeFi world. The other big one is Web3. So you take like what Amazon Web Services does between uh, storage and database and compute and all those layers that make Amazon Amazon are being decentralized as we speak. So you, you see projects like Filecoin or the Graph and others. Uh, each of those layers is is doing what DeFi is doing to, to banking, what what uh, Web3 will do to Amazon Web Services, et cetera. So we're seeing two really massive, like a financial and a technological shift. And this Web3 shift is what uh, the new internet will be uh, based on, which is really exciting to me. You mentioned DeFi before. Um, you have a collaboration with Blockforce. Can you elaborate on that? How do you guys make money? So Blockforce uh, uh, came to Vesper uh, and provided a, uh, uh, a a improvement proposal for our community. So um, if you think about, um, uh, we're really proud that Vesper is one of the fastest growing DeFi projects um, in crypto. We, we got to a 1.5 billion in uh, total value lock pretty quickly. But taking a step back, uh, that is all through MetaMask. That's through, all through Wallet Connect. That's all through uh, that singular blood vessel coming into uh, Vesper. And then if you think about how, how you uh, expand the spokes off of that hub, um, seeing a block force knock on our door and say, we want to create a vehicle 
for private investors to participate in, in Vesper. Because some people don't don't use MetaMask, if, if you believe that, uh, Coindesk TV users, there are people that don't use uh, MetaMask, which sounds crazy, but uh, there's a lot of people that uh, the, the form factors for them are not that comfortable. So investing into a, um, a private fund that's got a two and 20 model um, that will invest in uh, uh, Vesper is another uh, appendage. And then you can think about like what Grayscale does with Bitcoin and Ethereum. Maybe there will be a public vehicle for Vesper. Maybe there's, you know, there's all these different ways in terms of go to market for a, uh, a DeFi project like Vesper to, to leverage. And, and so we're really uh, uh, pleased that, that Blockforce knocked on our door and said, we want to build a fund uh, for uh, uh, building this connective tissue to, to Vesper. And what's interesting, and this is like one of the first public-private partnerships. So, so Vesper is a public blockchain, and Blockforce is a private uh, entity that's going to create this fund, and they're going to contribute twenty-five uh, percent of the management fee and the performance fee to the Vesper DAO. So, the Vesper community participates in those economics, which is again new, novel, new, primitive to uh, further extend the accessibility into uh, into DeFi. Matt, super cutting edge, really fascinating conversation. Thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks for having me. All right, that was Block Chairman and co-founder Matthew Rosick. Coming up, a look at Asia headlines and crypto markets analysis with BitPanda. Time now for the Daily Forecast, an update on what's happening in the Asia crypto markets. Here's Angie Lau of Forecast News. Welcome to the Daily Forecast, May 5th, 2021. I'm Angie Lau. Let's get you up to speed from Asia to the world. Dogecoin keeps on biting, up over 50% in the past 24 hours. And just to give you some perspective here, the meme coin's market cap is now higher than Chinese electronics maker Xiaomi and social media giant Snapchat. The move comes as support for Doge opens up on the eToro and Gemini exchanges. Meanwhile, here in Asia, Ben Kaslin, head of research at AAX, a digital asset exchange which recently listed Doge, says the coin's trading volume isn't out of the norm, but one trader did cash out on the exchange today in the amount of nearly one and a half million dollars worth of Doge. Dogecoin is definitely a norm breacher. And uh, what is driving the demand? I wouldn't say it's anything to do with technicals. I wouldn't say it's anything to do with kind of sound money conversations. This is a community driven token. Uh, it's an anti-establishment token. All this news is we are just days away from the Doge hype machine Elon Musk's hosting debut on SNL Saturday Night Live. As for the godfather of them all, taking a look at how Bitcoin traded during Asia hours today, down just under 2% on the day. And in the top 10 for cryptocurrencies, Uniswap V3 upgrade dropping, Uni up 7.5%, and Dogecoin grandparent blockchain Litecoin surging along with its descendant up nearly 17%. And a quick look at the Asian equity markets for you now, Kospi and ASX 200 in the green today. Turning to South Korea right now, where hearings for the new prime minister kick off tomorrow, and we are already getting a sense of what is to come in the crypto arena. In a written response to questions, Prime Minister nominee Kim bo Jeom maintains the same level of ambiguity that the Korean government has shown up to this point. On one hand, he wants no further delay in taxing crypto, while on the other, he's not willing to admit that cryptocurrency is actually a currency or a financial asset. So uh, kind of a political contradiction in logic right there. The statement may also spur another controversy here amongst the electorate as it ignores the criticism on taxing crypto investments, hearing no mention of investor protection or regulatory clarification for crypto holders in South Korea either. And finally, this deep dive now into the mining scene and how it's accelerating while the crypto market heats up. Crypto miners continue to chomp at the bit at Chia, and we 
have a forecast tour for you right now. Take a look inside Saiji Plaza in Shenzhen. This is one of Asia's biggest markets that sells all sorts of electronic accessories, including crypto mining rigs. A vendor there tells us that Chia Mining is the hottest mining project in China right now. Some shops are even out of stock for hard drives bigger than eight terabytes. If you want one, you'll have to be patient. It's on pre-order only, and you're going to have to wait up to three days for the $300 drive. Meanwhile, when it comes to mining, Singapore-based derivatives cryptocurrency exchange Bybit says, who needs hardware? It's launching a cloud mining service where customers can simply purchase mining contracts. Bybit says the hashing power or hash rate will come from remote data centers with shared computing power to mine Ether. Not only are people getting return based on kind of like uh, uh, their ETH uh, mining uh, products, also just from the appreciation of the underlying um, uh, asset. Think of cloud mining as mining as a service, and it is interesting that an exchange is creating this as a product for customers to participate in value creation. Another adaptation for this emerging decentralized economy. And that's the daily forecast. I'm Angie Lau. Until next time. The Crypto Markets Update is presented by Grayscale, the world's largest digital currency asset manager. Quick checkup on Bitcoin. The Coindesk Bitcoin price XBX index is currently trading at about just under $56,000, trading pretty flat over the past 24 hours. And the Coindesk Ether price ETX index right now at 33.82 ETH is down just a about 3% over the past 24 hours. The most reliable reference prices for institutions since 2014 are now published under the Coindesk brand, trusted globally as the leader in crypto news events and data. And our next guest heads crypto broker Bitpanda, which recently raised $170 million at an over $1 billion evaluation, making it one of the latest crypto companies to achieve unicorn status in the space. Joining us now to discuss the crypto markets and more is Bitpanda co-CEO and founder Eric DeMuth. Welcome, Eric. Hello. Hi. Good to see Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right, but before we dive into markets analysis, let's first talk about your raise. You hope to diversify financial products beyond digital assets like gold, and you're launching a new product that introduces 24-7 fractional stock trading. Perhaps you can explain to viewers how that works and why you feel it's necessary. Yeah, so first of all, it's it's launched as a, as a beta, right? So uh, this, is, this is very new in Europe to have fractional um, stocks plus 24-7 trading. Um, but over the next weeks and months, we will have hundreds and uh, thousands of assets like this. Um, why are we doing this? First of all, especially in Europe, you'd have a completely different system than, than in the US. In the US, you, you have Charles Schwab, you have um, uh, Robin Hood and so on, and people have 401k, and they're very much used to, to stocks. Here in, in, in Europe, like 90% do not own stocks of the retail customers. So you, you have a completely plain field and you have to provide the infrastructure. And um, this is only possible if you make it fractional. So you can have an Amazon stock that is over 3K right now, for everybody. Otherwise, uh, you cannot talk about democratizing and other fancy word. But the interface is not the issue in the user experience. It's the system itself you have to change. And this is why we thought all the learnings we have from cryptocurrency, 24-7 trading, fractional at any time for everybody, everybody gets the same deal. This has to be brought to other asset classes. And this is why we want to become the investment platform for everybody. And that, of course, always will have a, a huge focus on stocks, uh, crypto, sorry. So, Eric, you know, as you said, you're going from crypto to equities and not not leaving crypto, but you're you're expanding out into equities. Yeah. Uh, what kind of regulatory issues do you did you face or are you facing right now in the European Union? And also, what kind of uh, lessons are you learning from Hood? It sounds like you're 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 taking at least some of their playbook here. Yeah, I mean, you have to. I mean, our our. Um USP in Europe has always been to go the fully regulated way, always like licenses, even if you don't need them right now, but you always like be, be ahead of the curve. So, and Europe is a very fresh, uh, you know, like heterogenic market. So you, you, you just don't enter the European market, you enter every individual market because every regulator interpre interprets things differently and has different laws. So the problem in Europe is you cannot split a stock 
it's not possible. Everybody who tells you you have a fractional stock, you do not have like a split of a stock, you have a derivative. And now you can say, that's very easy, right? You have a derivative, why does it take so long? We worked over two years with this uh, on this with a regulator to find a way because um, you want to have something like a 101 copy. You want to have 100% asset back. So everything is 100% asset back. It's with the BNP Paribas. Uh, it's one of the biggest custody banks in Europe. Um, and, and we also have a mechanism that secures the asset uh, whenever things uh, might go, you know, like the market goes crazy and so on for the customer. So um, we wanted to have it as close as to the stock as possible and also uh, have the 24-7 trading option, which is very new, and you also get dividends and so on, everything automatically passed through to your account. So you don't really have a difference to um, trading it somewhere else, except you now have access to all the assets um, in, in, in every matter. I hope that answers your questions. I'm, I'm, may, maybe I was drawn away. <laughs> I think yeah, that's really Emily interesting. A... Um, just to you recently had a, a big fundraise, which I believe was led by Valor Ventures, which was co-founded by Peter Thiel, who also, incidentally, um, has made some recent very negative comments about Bitcoin, about how it was like a tool of the Chinese government. And, and I'm just curious if there's any tension here. So no, not at all. As far as I, as, as I understood the interview, um, First of all, I think he's very bullish on that. But but I think um, he also said like the euro is the same thing. I think it was just a matter of what can be you know like harm for the for the uh, U.S. currency in general. And um, then I think it got put out of context. And then it was like one sentence. And and yeah. So I think I think it was a bit over exaggerated then his comments. But overall, I think we're all aligned on here. I, I think we have the same the same message. We have the same mission. And um, um, yeah, we are very bullish and Valar as well. Eric, maybe I could get your <coughs> pardon me, outlook on the markets. And is your expansion into the equities market, is that a hedge against crypto in case the markets tank? Our approach to go to equities is not very new because two years ago we have started this philosophy with uh, gold, silver, and so on. You have real physical gold in a high security world. It's 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 uh, it's um, secured and, and insured and so on. And it just took us so long with with uh, stocks. And it's not a hedge because our philosophy is you just want to have one platform for your finance and for your trading. So we would like to offer everything. Whenever you want to do something with your money, you can do this. And our philosophy is treat everything that has value in the same same way. And um, in the conversation you had before, you were talking about uh, Dogecoin and so on. Is it a currency and so on? I say when it has value, it can be treated as a currency. It doesn't matter what it is. So this is why, for example, we have our our uh, Visa card, and it's you can link everything with it. You can pay now with your Tesla stock at the supermarket. You can pay with gold, you can pay with Bitcoin or with Euro, it doesn't matter. Everything that has value will be treated in the same way. And I think that is the future of, of, of currency. And this is the, the, what, what Bitcoin has brought to us. Are you seeing a lot of interest right now in ETH? Is it, uh, are you seeing in, in, in Europe at least a, a spike in uh, people trying to buy ETH? Yeah, I mean, this is a global thing. Uh, I think this is not a matter of uh, we're, like in the US or something. Um, we are living in a very digital, globalized world. And when you have the Doge frenzy, as for example, we have Doge for over two years, I think, on our platform. When things go crazy with Doge, things go crazy on our platform as well in Europe. Uh, same with Ethereum right now. Um, I think this is this is very synchronized. Either it's happening in the US or in Europe. Mm -hmm. Eric, thanks for joining us on the show. Appreciate your time and congratulations on the latest raise. Thank you very much. It was nice. All right. That was Bitpanda's co-CEO and founder, Eric DeMuth. Coming up, the S&P Dow Jones indices are getting into crypto and checking in with Coindesk Global Policy and Regulation Managing Editor, Nick Day. We are witnessing the greatest paradigm shift in finance in modern history. Join thousands of newsmakers and influencers talking the future of money in a live virtual experience. Consensus by Coindesk. Register today.
The Coindesk Spotlight is brought to you by Nexo, the place to earn on Bitcoin, Ethereum, and more. Earlier this week, Coindesk broke the news that S&P Dow Jones indices launched its first three cryptocurrency indexes. S&P's crypto indexes are poised to add more visibility to Bitcoin and Ether data among Wall Street traders hungry to decode crypto price action. Joining us now is Peter Rothman, Global Head of Innovation at S&P Dow Jones Indices. Welcome, Peter, to the show. <coughs> Thank you for having me. Great to have you. All right. So you're offering a crypto index for Bitcoin, Ether, and a mega cap combo of the two. But when I took a look at the chart, it's not very intuitive. The price listed a much lower price than the actual price of Bitcoin, and that's because it tracks appreciation rather than the price. But why track it like that? Is this setting the stage for, um, if you could continue? Yeah, so basically the way indices work is that they start with a base level, which is when the index was was brought on, usually that there's an inception date, and there's an appreciation uh, that's measured uh, by a level, and you can look at it over different periods of time, and that's the standard way um, equity indices, fixed income indices, and, and, and other indices are measured. So this is a way of looking at them apples to apples. Um, you know, you can always look at the underlying prices as well. Uh, but it's a way of it's a way of standardizing and getting getting all of these uh, these assets sort of under one uh, comparative umbrella. Mm -hmm. And this seems to be your initial foray. Uh, do you see more crypto related financial products being released? <laughs> well, so so if you're asking about financial products uh, licensing these indices, I think absolutely there's a lot of interest uh, uh, from a lot of a lot of areas of the marketplace in terms of other indices that we would do. Yes, there is an intention to do some broader indices uh, across a wider uh, uh, selection of cryptocurrencies over uh, the next couple of months. Morning, Peter. You have a mega cap index. Uh, how is it weighted exactly, uh, and how often do you re re rebalance it? There's there's quarterly rebalancing, and it's weighted by uh, coin supply uh, times the uh, the price at the time of rebalance. So it, so it's not quite market cap. It's not quite price. It's its own weighting, correct? It, it, I would say it's loosely uh, analogous to market cap. If you look at sort of the coin supply and you take the price, that's that's kind of the equivalent uh, of of what I think one in an equity would call market cap. Right, and then what's the best way? Do you think to capture volatility in in the uh, larger cap uh, it, in the larger cap assets? Uh, capturing volatility, I mean, there's there's certainly people can certainly create derivatives on these indices uh, uh, to measure just that, uh, to trade just that. Uh, S and P has the uh, the VIX indices, for example, uh, uh, which are implied volatility on the S and P five hundred. Um, so there'll be a, a, a lot of financial innovation around these indices and the next uh, set of indices that, that we're doing. Good morning. Can you tell us a little bit what the backstory is to this product? Like, was there a, was there demand coming from a certain segment, or did you, or, or, or was it just decided this is something that the market needs? How did this come about? Who was asking for it? <laughs> that, that, that's a, that's a great question. I think it actually was multiple factors, right? I think that that. There was a realization that there's more and more institutional interest in this asset class, and you know you can see that by infrastructure, uh, uh, more and more firms investing. I mean, the show before uh, they got to me, you guys were talking about that in various forms. So I think that that more and more interest in, from the mainstream institutions uh, has sparked our uh, our interest in doing this, as well as improved infrastructure, uh, and and that's important for us because we have to create indices with reliable. Pricing and, and and other apparatus in, in order to uh, reflect uh, uh, the quality that we bring. Peter, do you hold Bitcoin yourself, and where do you see Bitcoin headed in the three <laughs> end of I, year? I, I'm I'm not a, a particularly active investor, but I, I won't comment on my own portfolio. Um, in terms of, of of Bitcoin direction, you know, I, I really can't speak to that. Uh, S and P doesn't forecast uh, uh, for its indices. Um, uh, there's clearly institutional interest. There's clearly uh, forces uh, in, in both directions, but uh, I'm really not uh, not equipped right. to comment on that at this time. All right, Peter. Uh, congratulations on the new project. Uh, it will be interesting to see how it develops. Thanks for joining the show. Thanks so much. Appreciate it.
All right, that was S&P Dow Jones Indices Global Head of Innovation, Peter Rothman. Time to check in with Coindesk Global Policy and Regulation Managing Editor, Nick Day, who is also the editor of Coindesk's The State of Crypto Newsletter. Hey there, Nick. Hey, good morning. All right, so what are you looking at this morning? So something caught my eye yesterday. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen went to a uh, Wall Street Journal event and spoke about crypto regulation. She said that the crypto regulatory framework in the U.S. is currently inadequate. And while she did cite some of the you know familiar complaints about concerns around money laundering and illicit finance, she did also say that, you know, in her view, the current framework does need to be updated. It needs to be more clear who's in charge of what and, you know, how uh, crypto assets are to be treated under the law in the U.S. Do, do you Nick, think I know that you're the expert across- on, on Yellen's comments on cryptocurrency. Um, of those comments, which of them is the most new or the most notable? Is like, is there anything there that's really different from something she said in the past? I, I think just the acknowledgement that the regulatory framework in the U.S. is inadequate is pretty. That is, I think, the first time she's discussed that. It is a view, you know, many in the crypto industry would agree with. Um, yeah, there are concerns about what the SEC can or cannot do and what the limitations are. Uh, in particular, you know, when can a company launch a token and raise funds? Right now, the SEC treats most of that as, you know, a security sale. But there is, you know, there are legislative efforts underway to try and clarify, you know, when the CFTC actually has jurisdiction, uh, when a certain cryptocurrency is definitely, you know, more a commodity and less a security than when it is, you know, clearly something that's just being used to raise funds and, you know, uh, act as a as an investment of sorts in that company. Nick, she's coming. Uh, she's, of course, not the biggest fan of crypto, but she would be working on this potentially or, or at least giving some guidance that one would assume with Gary Gensler, who isn't necessarily an enemy of crypto. So do you think that potentially uh, incoming chairman uh, uh, Gensler uh, may sway her a little bit to go softer on uh, regulating crypto or, or softer on suggesting regulations on crypto. Yeah, I think the fact that Gensler is involved cannot be, you know, underestimated. Um, you know, just the other day, he announced that his new chief economist is a Wharton uh, professor who taught a course on crypto. So his staff already has crypto experience. We know that the SEC staffers have been looking at crypto for quite a while now. Um, I think, you know, even beyond looking beyond just the SEC, a lot of the administrations, uh, the new administration's staffers who might be involved in this do have some familiarity with crypto, which is not something we saw four years ago. So, you know, at the very least, you know, I, I don't think we can say necessarily that they're enemies of crypto, but just the fact that they understand this mm-hmm. and might have a better idea of what we're talking about is, I, I think, a pretty positive signal, at least in terms of whether or not we'll see clarity coming along. Yeah, we'll see what happens next. Thank you, Nick, for the update. Thank you. That was Coindesk Managing Editor of Global Policy and Regulation, Nick Day. Don't forget to sign up for the State of Crypto newsletter on Coindesk.com. Calm. Time now to check in with Crypto Twitter with our tweet of the day. This from Alex Thorne, head of research at Galaxy Digital, tweeting, Dogecoin has always been a joke, and the joke just keeps getting funnier. We at Galaxy Research just published the world's most comprehensive report on Doge, titled Dogecoin, the world's most honest coin. Can't say that on air, but just goes to show, uh, you know, first analyst report on Doge, it's it's getting serious out there. That's it for First Mover. Coming up tomorrow is special guest Gary Vaynerchuk. Thank you, Emily Parker, our Coindesk Managing Director of International Content, and Lawrence Luton, Managing Editor of Global Capital Markets. I'm your host, Christine Lee. I'll be back live at 3 p.m. with all that Bitcoin. Coming up at 10.30 is Cointoss, and at noon is The Hash. You're watching Coindesk TV.